I want to make sure that, first of all, I officially welcome everyone here. I believe everybody knows me, but I'm Juliana Mosley. I am the Chief Diversity, uh, Inclusion, and Community Relations Officer here at the college. Um, and I am grateful for our panelists um, today who are colleagues and friends um, who are lending their voice. Um, I want to give a caveat that says, you know, while people, of course, wear multiple identities, and we know that two of our panelists are psychologists and faculty, and, and our third panelist is our uh, missions um, officer for the college and, and a pastoral uh, counselor, that I have asked them instead to be here in their personal voice today. And while they may offer some commentary that lends to their positions, um, they're really here more in, in a personal way. Um, and so I hope that people are respectful um, of the voice in which they're coming today, um, as well as you know myself um, when some comments are made. So I just wanted to make sure that people understand that. Then I want to make sure that we can go over very quickly um, the rules of engagement. I do this for all programs um, that we have. And so our rules of engagement, number one, everyone's voice is valued. So um, as we're going to be communicating, you will have the chat room uh, to be able to communicate um, as well as if you can raise your hand, I will then um, try to come to you for questions or comments when we get to that part of the program. Um, this is also a brave space. Uh, which is to be created for all voices to be heard. Um, each person, of course, always has the right to disagree. We want to do so respectfully. That's never a problem in our community, but I always say it. This discussion will be for the edification of our immediate community, which is in this space, um, our college, and of course, then even beyond that for the communities in which we live and work um, outside of this space. And then lastly, that everyone will be a respecter of time and sharing of talking space. An hour and a half program virtually um, can be a little tough, but um, it's possible. I know that people may need to adjust and get up and take water and whatever you need to do, do that. It's hard to be attentive sometimes this long, um, but we will do the best that we can. So um, let me make sure I'm getting everything I'm supposed to say right now. Okay. So what are our objectives? Wow, this is always um, an interesting one. I think at this point, this is our first attempt at a conversation, right? Hearing from the personal voices, um, allowing hopefully our participants um, to speak or have questions or comments. I know that this is a very fresh time still. Um, there was some debate from myself and the panelists about perhaps delaying this and doing it next week. Um, but then we also thought that the timeliness of now um, is where people maybe need an outlet and don't have it. And so um, we thought now is better. And then perhaps there may need to be a part two, um, if you will, especially now that we know that there are issues of people getting in due to space. Um, so I wanted to make sure that people kind of understand it's really just at this moment to be together um, and to just start the conversation. I don't think that we're going to walk away with tangible next steps at this point. This is just to kind of excel, uh, as we said. So that is the reason we are here. So having said that, our three panelists, um, first we have Dr. Jason Freeman, um, who is one of our newer faculty, I guess he's passed his one year mark, so he can't say he's um, the new kid on the block anymore. Um, but uh, Jason um, is a faculty member in um, psychology for um, the School of Undergraduate Studies. And he has been one of my co-facilitators before for Diversity Spotlight, so I'm glad to have him with us. Um, second is Dr. Cheryl Rothardy, and I think everybody knows Cheryl because she's, you know, a little bit of a CHC lifer, and uh, she is uh, the, not only faculty, but she is the chair for um, our graduate, um, or excuse me, our PsyD program, um, our doctoral program in psychology, um, and so we are happy to have her, and then our final uh, panelist is 
Ms. Cara McMahon. And of course, as I said, she is our missions officer um, for the college and um, oftentimes my co-presenter. And so we have our panelists. So the order of kind of the day or, or our program is that our panelists have been asked to basically make an opening statement. Um, and they were kind of given some things to guide them in this process as they make their opening statements. Um, each one will make an opening statement and there will be a video behind that person. So there will be a video after uh, Dr. Freeman, then Dr. Rothrady will make her statement. There will be a video behind her. Uh, then Ms. McMahon will make her statement and then there'll be a video um, behind her. And then we will kind of start to engage with questions and move the program forward. So that is the order of the day. So having said that, uh, Dr. Freeman, you have the floor. Hey, I think I'm unmuted. Um, cool. Thanks, Juliana, for, for having me. Um, so this is this is sort of sort of different for me. I'm a fairly um, introverted person by nature, um, and sort of being being vulnerable in, in this way, particularly in public and professional spaces, um, is not necessarily natural for me or easy. Um, but when Juliana reached out to me and asked me uh, if I was willing to participate in this program, the answer was really an easy yes. Um, and that answer was so easy because I think it's important. Um, for our community and for just people in general to see me um, as, a, as a black man sharing his experience. Um, I think we have a lot of responsibility and a lot of power to potentially impact people within our own sphere of influence, um, no matter what that sphere might be. So, you know, that's, that's why I'm here. Um, and, you know, kind of how, how Juliana mentioned, I'm not really here to intellectualize um, these recent events but more to just share my experience, my feelings, um, and hopefully um, give voice and face to, to what it's like to sort of um, to live in, in, in my skin and, and what that feels like. Um, so in, you know, sort of thinking about this and how I wanted to approach it, um, I came across a quote from James Baldwin that I thought was particularly pertinent. Um, so I'm going to read that quote and then um, talk a little bit. Um, so the quote is, to be a Negro in this country is really never to be looked at. What white people see when they look at you is not visible. What they do see when they look at you is that they is what they have invested you with. Um, and I thought that this quote really captured um, my... I'm sorry? We need people to mute, please, if you're not speaking. Please mute. Oh. Okay, I thought that comment was for me. Sorry. Um, so I, I thought that this quote um, was, was really pertinent and resonated with me um, because it captures this feeling of, you know, people see me, but they don't see me, right? And that's, that's sort of important, right? So you know, what, what does that look like for me? And I, and I, you know, trying to think of some personal experiences. So this is, this is a, um, a personal experience that I, that I had. So I, I completed my PhD at Florida State University. Um, and I was at FSU from 2013 to 2018. And for those of you who don't know, FSU is in Tallahassee. Um, and if you're not familiar with sort of the Florida geography, that's in the panhandle. Um, and in terms of describing that area, um, it's sort of more like South Georgia than what we would typically think of when we think of Florida, palm trees and beaches and whatnot. Um, so, um, you know, this story is an experience about an interaction that I had with a white man um, and, you know, how he, I feel, saw me, what he invested me with, um, as Baldwin would say. So one weekend, my wife and I and a couple of friends, right, we decided that we were going to take a trip to the beach um, and the closest beaches in Tallahassee is about 45 minutes to an hour away. So, you know, we're preparing for this trip. Um, and we decided that we're going to stop at the local Publix, which is sort of like the big grocery store in Florida, pick up some sandwiches, whatever else we need, um, and be on our way. All right. So we head over to the deli and working behind the counter at the deli is a upper middle-aged, I'd say white man, um, 
to you know take orders and, and make sandwiches and whatnot. So as I approach, this man is looking at me sort of strange, right? So I'm already put off a bit by the way that he's looking at me. Um, so I'm thinking, like, do I know him from somewhere? Does he know me from somewhere? Why is he looking at me in this way? So before I even get the opportunity to even say what I want to order or anything like that, um, he says something to me to the effect of, you know, you look familiar. Where do I know you from? All right. So I'm already a little sort of vigilant about this interaction um, because I know that I don't know this man. Right. And this is not even the publics that we normally go to. This is like on the way to the beach. Um, so, you know, I try to just laugh off the comment of kind of like, yeah, I must I must have one of those faces, you know, or, you know, that people just sort of recognize. Um, but then he sort of looks at me a little bit more deeply and he says, oh, you know, I think I know what it is. It must be from one of those photos that I've seen hanging in the post office. Oh, my God. Right. And, you know, I'm God. really taken aback by that, right? So when he looks at me, he sees immediately the image of a mugshot from the post office, a criminal, right? It didn't matter that, you know, I went to an Ivy League college and I had a master's degree and I'm working on a PhD. You know, I did things, quote unquote, the right way or I'm doing things the right way. Um, you know, all he saw when he saw me was another black thug, right? He, he saw me, but he didn't see me, right? So, you know, that's sort of what, what I'm talking about. And that's, I think, why when these things happen and when they happen often, it's so exhausting, it's so enraging, it's so emotional because they remind you and remind me that as a black man, there's a lot of people who are gonna view me as immediately threatening and they would rather see me dead or see me in jail. And it's a reminder of just how quickly mundane things can turn dangerous or deadly, right? A routine traffic stop, a mistaken identity, an encounter in the park, an afternoon jog, any of these things I know have the potential to go the wrong way. Um, you know, I was training for a marathon before all the COVID-19 shut down. And, you know, I was a runner. I run through the neighborhood. I, I sort of do all that and, and, you know, not a problem. But, you know, now there's not a day that I sort of lace up and go out to run I don't think about Ahmaud Arbery, right? I know that somebody could decide, hmm, you don't look like you belong in this neighborhood. You know, let me take care of that. Um, so it kind of leaves me feeling like, what can I do safely in this country? When am I not in danger? Um, and that is, you know, sort of my, has been my experience in, in, in this. Thank you, Dr. Freeman. We appreciate your candor. Um, and sharing of your story. At this time, I'm going to share my screen. Um, speaking, uh, this is a, a video that has been going wild, honestly, on uh, social media. And, um, and it speaks very much to what Dr. Freeman was just talking about. And so I think, here we go. All right, can you all see something yet? All oh, right, okay, so. Before you call, the, you call the cops, I just want you to know the first thing that I did when I woke up this morning was yell at my alarm clock. My parents were raised in the South. I have to roll tide or they'll disown me. They raised me in Las Vegas. That city still has my heart. I hate spiders. I'm a vegetarian. I'm not proud about it. I've done goat yoga. I'm really not proud about that. I can tell you every single word off the NWA Straight Outta Compton album. I can also sing you every single word from Oklahoma. Bananas are disgusting. I am a Christian. I spend almost every Sunday morning teaching kids in Sunday school. I am often asked if I am Muslim. I'm okay with that. 
I'm pretty much convinced if you met my mother, you'd automatically become a better person. My father is a veteran. He taught me how to say yes, sir, and yes, ma'am, to everyone that I meet. I don't hate our president. I pray for him. I love basketball and also hockey. This is my brother, James. This is my brother, Mike. This is my brother, John. And this is my brother, Rob. I've never been to jail. I've never owned a gun. I hate that anyone at all might possibly be afraid of me. I'd go around the world and back again if I knew that single act might make your day better. I'm a proud man. I'm a proud black man. Does any of this really matter? No. I just wanted you to get to know me better before you call the cops. At this time, we will have Dr. Shaw Rothery. Thank you, um, Juliana, and thank you so much for having the courage um, to host this event. And um, Jason, thank you for sharing your story. Um, and I think everyone should know that we could share a million of those stories a day because they come fast and furious um, every day of our lives. So Juliana asked me to speak um, because she knows that I have two African-American sons. My Malcolm is 26 and he lives in New York. And my Jojo, who now wants to be called Joseph, is almost 17 and he's at home with me doing what um, I've heard many teenagers are doing right now, sleeping, which is good because I don't want him to hear me speak right now and see me upset yet again today. I think that every black mother of a black son and even more broadly of a black child has that moment when they come to the realization that the world is a dangerous place and that their child is a target and that their child is prey. And for me, that day came on July 13th, 2013, when the trade bond Martin verdict came down. That was a turning point for me um, because I didn't believe it was possible for the man who killed Trayvon Martin to be found um, innocent. And I was sitting in the kitchen, cooking and watching television, and my youngest son was there. My oldest son was in New York at college. And when they issued the verdict, I stopped breathing. And it's so interesting to me that I can't breathe is a mantra for what's happening because that day, I stopped breathing. And that night I went to bed and I surrendered my sons to the world because I knew that I could not protect them. And I had to resign myself to that fact. And it was one of the most painful realizations of my life and I have lived with it every day since. And every time another black or brown boy or man is shot down, or even, you know, girl or woman, because women are, are just as vulnerable, um, you feel deep, deep sorrow for the mother, the father, the family. But there's um, an element of vicarious traumatization because of the awareness that I know that that could be my son. And I know there, but for the grace of God, go my sons. And um, 
it is not an easy thing to go to bed with every night and wake up with every morning. And when COVID struck, um, you know, my son in New York couldn't get out of New York because of the quarantine. And that was okay because he has this village of friends who love him in New York. And so I wasn't worried about him. But now I am extremely worried about him. And I'm leaving here tomorrow and I'm going to get my child. And I'm bringing him home, COVID or not. I just hope that the bridges don't close before I get in and out of the city so that I can bring my child home. He decided he was gonna to go to that rally in New York on Friday. And we had a long talk about why he had to go and why I had to respect his right as a black man to go and stand up and say that his life was worth something, even if it meant his death. And so I stopped breathing again that Friday when he went to that rally and he told me, he said, mom, I have to turn my phone off because they said that if you keep your phone on and you say something they don't like, you might get arrested. So I won't be able to communicate with you until I get home. And so I waited and thank God he got home safely. But right now he's so angry and so hurt and so confused because at 26 years old, he was deluded into thinking that the world was a different place. He grew up in a very different world. We all did. We thought we were in a different world. We were not in a different world. We were all fooled. Um, but reality has hit and he is angry and he is hurt and he is confused. And like Jason, my son went to Columbia University. My son works for a Fortune 500 company. He did everything right. And not that that entitles him to live more than any other black man or black child, but he played by the rules of the system that was created. And yet his life is in just as much danger as the man who was brutally murdered the other day and the weeks before that and the weeks before that. He is no different. And again, acknowledging that reality is what I live with every day and every night. And so that is what it is to be a black mother and what it has been for a very long time, but especially right now. Thank you, Dr. Rothery. Um, your story is painful to hear, so I can only imagine how much more painful to live. There is an old saying that there's nothing like a mother's prayer. And so I know you are praying and God hears you. He's protecting them. And in the midst of all of this, I believe they will come out and be just fine. The next video that I'm sharing, much like Dr. Rothery's voice as a mother, is a video again that has been going um, viral on social media. And it is a young teenage man singing a song, I Just Want to Live. It was written by his mother. And so for me, that was the connection um, to have it right after Dr. Rothby speaks. I'm a young black man Doing all that I can To stay And I see what's being done to my kind Every day I'm being hunted as prey My people don't want no trouble We've had enough, show go I just wanna leave Leave. 
was just a black boy brought up in the white world. I just wanna ask God if I'm in the right world. Is my life a test or is my life a curse? They put us in an ambulance, got us in a hearse. Cause another brother deceased, but it doesn't matter. Killed by the police, are we in a handcuff? I don't wanna take a knee, I just wanna stand up. Where's the new QEP? Call the Black Panthers. Just do the math, they subtract us like minus. Fuck COVID, KKK is the virus. We are not afraid, we will not stay quiet. They will always label a rebellion or riot. Kill a black man seems to be the assignment. White supremacists terrorize the environment. Guns and the canine, tasers and sirens. I just wanna live, I don't wanna live violent. We don't want violence. My people don't want no trouble. We had enough, show go. presenter, Ms. Cara McMahon. Deep breath. Um, yeah, Juliana, thank you for, for hosting um, this dialogue. Thank you both to Jason and Cheryl for being um, vulnerable and transparent. And um, let me start with uh, I have a lot of conversations around white privilege in my life, and this might be the very first time where I feel this uh, uncomfortable um, to be speaking. But, um, you know, it, it's been a long time that I have been in the work of my own um, internal sense of white privilege and what that means. Um, I think a little part of my uh, natural inclination um, towards uh, this work has actually come from um, being the, the daughter of Irish immigrants and a father who was uh, heavily engaged as well as uh, passed along to his children um, the movement in Northern Ireland of, um, you know, the IRA uh, of violence um, in a country, uh, but a notion, a lot of notions around oppression. And I can really only go to that space and place of intellectual kind of understanding that gave me a natural inclination. But the heart for me is um, is that you know my honesty says none of this makes sense to me um, as I'm sitting here listening like everyone else to uh, the experience of others um, people of color um, every uh, every cell of my body is um, is having a reaction and a really strong reaction. Um, so if that's the case, my question has throughout my adult and professional life has been, um, how is it possible that any other person doesn't feel the way that I feel? That doesn't make sense to me. And, um, I believe in God and, you know, we, we have a lot of conversations in my field of mission and ministry about God and a God that loves unconditionally and loves all of God's children and that we are God's creation. So even in that um, integrated fabric of who I am, none of this makes sense. Years ago, I remember uh, at um, 
another institution I worked at, my closest colleagues, one was um, an African-American male, one a Filipino male, and one um, part uh, Taiwanese, part Black. And we were driving in the car, and I was in the back seat next to, uh, next to one of my pals, my colleagues, they're dear friends. And he turned to me, he called me McManus. My last name is McMahon. His nickname was McManus. And he said, you know what, McManus, you're going to get us pulled over. And of course, I think maybe we were just going to lunch. And I looked at him, I said, what are you talking about? And he says, you kidding me, a white woman in the back seat with three men of color, you're going to get us pulled over. And those are my, um, that's one example of when my whiteness uh, played a role in my life. Uh, but the, the privileged piece, you know, I, I want everyone to be very clear that white privilege does not speak to a white person's experience that doesn't involve struggle. Someone can um, experience struggle who is white, but the point is, is that there are um, privileges that come with whiteness and struggle that others experience because they are not. It, and, and for me in this conversation, I have to say, as, as I do so often, one, I am not an expert. Um, two, I'm just okay with being uncomfortable at this point in my life with this conversation. Three, I'm doing the work every single day. And, and I think that for if white people do not get involved and i don't mean just start saying nice things and prayerful things and loving things but i mean starting to talk about it regularly with one another and take action that creates change i honestly don't know where change comes from unless we act upon the values and the ethics that we say we um, assert ourselves to. And for that matter, I say I am not just an ally because I am friends with people of color and I support uh, their lives. I can't believe that we just have to say that life. But I'm an advocate because I am unwilling to sit down. I'm unwilling to do nothing. And in fact, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to be here um, at a point in time where there is contentiousness. White people have to be, to be having the conversations, educating themselves. And um, by golly, I don't ever want to be the reason that anyone gets pulled over. Thank you, Cara. Um, we appreciate your voice, even when um, there are trying times for uh, people of color, particularly black people in this instance. Um, I personally recognize that we don't do this work um, for change alone, um, and that it is important to have our white brothers and sisters who see themselves as advocates um, to be a part of the process with us. So thank you. Um, for today, but just kind of for always being the, iv the, the ivory to my ebony. Um, the next video um, is a little different. I, again, was kind of looking for videos that, that were common people, right, common folk. Um, I turned to social media for a reason because that, that is kind of the common way of um, getting out. And so this woman, um, I had to cut a lot of it out. You're only going to hear her for about two minutes. Um, I apologize. Uh, she, she uses uh, the word hell quite a few times uh, in the video. So I, it's not to offend, um, but you will hear um, her heart. So I'll be sharing. Don't get 
the racism thing. So I have been one of the people that have been like, no, this can't be racially motivated. You know, and I hear the black community with, you know, the Black Lives Matter and all this stuff. And I hear them in saying there's so much racism going on. And for people like me that don't have a grid for racism, I don't see it because I don't relate to it. So first of all, forgive me for not having that lens. Um, I don't ever want to have that lens, um, but I don't also want to detract from my brothers and sisters that are going through hell. Um, and if that is the case, it is going to take every freaking white American to stand up and make a difference, to stand up and say, oh, hell no, not in my country, not on my watch, not in my lifetime, this is gonna stop. If this is actually what's going on, that we have black Americans that are literally afraid of law enforcement because this kind of crap is going on, it's not the black Americans' responsibility to stand up and try and change that. If it is rooted in racism, if it is rooted in any kind of white supremacist crap, it is our job to stand up. I will tell you that I have been one that's like, okay, so when there's a, a Muslim terrorist attack, the Muslims need to stand up and reject those people out of their religion, right? The, the peaceful, loving, wonderful Muslims need to go, oh, well, hell no, you're not Muslim, get the hell out. I'm saying the same thing for white people. We need to stand up and look at whoever this is, whether it's law enforcement, whether it's whatever organization of white people and say, oh, hell no, you are not American. Oh, hell no, you don't embody what we stand for. And oh, hell no, you're not welcome in this country, as far as I'm concerned. I don't know how to fix this problem other than every white American using their peer pressure and saying, uh-uh, this is not okay. And I will say the only thing I can think of um, that might change this within law enforcement is there needs to be you know special circumstances that if a law enforcement officer unduly causes the death of no matter who, what color the person is, they need to be like prosecuted worse because they're supposed to stand have a standard that is far and above beyond any of us, right? They're law enforcement. They should be elevated to a much higher standard and bar than the rest of us. Therefore, in my opinion, they should be prosecuted at a higher standard. In my opinion, my opinion only, and you guys can disagree. You can say I'm half cocked. So that was, um, her take, and uh, again, she's probably one of the uh, most vocal uh, white videos that um, has gone viral um, since this time. So what we're going to do now um, is to start with some questions with our panelists, um, and I will kind of throw the questions out there for um, Cara, Cheryl, and Jason, and whoever wants to get in, um, please do so for the three of them. So one question is this, people are experiencing ever-present hyper-vigilance, right? All these emotions, fear, anger, sadness. How do you relate at this time? So for me, um, it's, it's this acknowledgement that I can place myself into the shoes of the people who are being murdered, the people um, who are being harassed, the people who are being assaulted, right? So if I know that this is just based off of a perception, right? I can't educate myself into safety. I can't behave myself into safety. It's really just a matter of, of luck. Um, 
you know, that, that I survive is how it, how it feels. You know, I, I, you know, if, if, if there's a police car behind me, I'm, I can feel it in my body. My heart is, is racing. I'm like, do whatever you got to do to not ever have to interact with, with police, avoid that at all costs. Um, but you know, you, you just never, you never quite feel settled because you never know what's around the corner. Um, you know, we, we talked a little, well, we haven't talked about it here, but you know, this the Amy Cooper situation that luckily didn't end um, in, in tragedy in that way, but such a mundane situation. I'm going to the park to watch birds. You know, there's not a safer activity, a person that I can think of that a person could want to do, right? And in an instant, one interaction that turns into a confrontation has the potential to lead to the end of my life. And that is a really, really scary prospect to, to deal with. Um, and it's every day, you know, like it, it just beats you down. So that's my thought. Cheryl, I think you were gonna speak. Um, yes, I was just gonna say that I think um, all of those feelings that you described and so many more happen um, all throughout the day. And, you know, from moment to moment, um, you never know how, you, how you're going to feel. And so what I have been doing is allowing myself to feel what I feel, be where I am. Um, I'm grateful that I have places and spaces where I can express myself. Um, and, um, and I think it's healthy um, that we, because if we have safe spaces to talk about it, then it doesn't eat us up and erode our insides. Um, and it also doesn't cause us to, to have to lash out because sometimes you, when you don't feel heard and when you feel retaliated against for just existing, um, we are, we, we are hardwired to, to protect ourselves and protecting yourself in this world, uh, in the vessels that, that we're in could, could be the very end, the end of our lives. Um, because if just breathing, um, and existing put your life at risk. Imagine what it would be like to try to protect yourself. So, um, so we have to find healthy ways to get those feelings out, um, to find the words for things that happen for which there are no words. Um, and so that, that is what I strive to do. Um, and that is also what I strive to help others do. Thank you. Cara, did you want to respond on this one or do you want me to hit you with the next question? Uh, you're welcome to hit me with the next question as I see it before me. Okay. <laughs> Please share your thoughts on white silence regarding issues of racism. And then the second part, if you will, to that would be, what would you say to a white friend who says, but I don't know what to say. So, um, I think I, I, I pointed out what I, I think a little bit about white silence. I, I think that white silence is what is, um, is um, in part responsible for the violence and the killings um, that we have most recently seen and that we have seen throughout all of our history. Um, for me, this conversation is not uh, just about the most um, recent atrocities. Um, this conversation is about hundreds of years of people um, suffering uh, oppression. And um, a friend of mine used a quote yesterday uh, on um, a post in which he reflected on his experiences um, in, in this moment as a black man. And at the end, he used a Nigerian proverb that says, a child does not feel the warmth of the village. If a child that does not feel the warmth of the village will burn it down to feel the warmth of the fire. And to me, that says um, something to me about being the village that has not um, done its work uh, around that child. I always say we mother one another. Uh, we, we have to do um, better as white people um, 
around the world, but specifically in, in this country, um, to be a village that, um, that offers a, a belonging differently. And, and I don't mean to make that sound uh, by, by using the word belonging. I, I mean it really deeply and really rooted um, and, really, and really true. But I find that, um, you know, there's a, a great book called Tattoos on the Heart, which Father Gregory Boyle says, um, I'm paraphrasing here, um, but essentially that we should not, um, we should not judge the way in which someone deals with the burden of which they carry, but rather get to the questions and deal with the burden of which they carry. Why does that burden exist? Um, I don't know that we do that. And my greatest fear is that we're hearing a lot of voices right now and that people are um, expressing similar to what the woman in the video expressed. But my greatest fear is that voices will die out as though until the next situation occurs. That's my greatest. It's, it's been my greatest fear. And currently um, it makes uh, my hair stand up that, that that's, um, as, as a white person, that's my fear. Um, and, uh, we have to commit to a constant conversation and there should not, in my opinion, and in my deepest sense of belief of a God in the world, um, we cannot be silent anymore. If this isn't enough, by goodness, I don't know what is. Cheryl or Jason, what do you say to that white friend who says, I don't know what to say? Um, I think that I think that, that is a is a legitimate response in in the moment. Um, because again, I think it speaks to the fact that the atrocities are such that there are no words in, in the English language or in any language to um, adequately capture what someone should say. So if we weren't in the midst of COVID and a white friend of mine said that, I would say then hug me. That's what I would say, hug me, hug me. I'm going to move forward and I'm going to, um, if you haven't seen it, this is new. Um, I'll, I'll try to share it um, in some type of a, a wrap up email, but uh, my president, some of you also still claim him as your president. You can see him right here. Uh-huh. Uh, Barack Obama um, just released uh, an article that was posted yesterday. It's called How to Make This Moment the Turning Point for Real Change. And um, be, as I'm working into our next question, I'm going to quote him first. He said, the waves of protest across the country represent a genuine and legitimate frustration over a decades-long failure to reform police practices and the broader criminal justice system in the United States. The overwhelming majority of participants have been peaceful, courageous, responsible, and inspiring. They deserve our respect and support, not condemnation, something that police in cities like Camden and Flint have commendably understood. And I'm gonna add Houston. Houston has not had um, issues either. So um, that's his quote. So I wanna think, think about um, what he's saying here as I ask this question. Did either of the three of you uh, participate in any of the protests um, that happened this weekend? If so, would you be willing to share your thoughts or highlights of your experience? I, I did. Um, I was... Um, sitting at home on a Saturday morning and I'm a doctoral student. So I was really trying to focus on my schoolwork. Uh, but 
knowing me, a lot of my work is around these kinds of issues. So I opened my book of Paulo Freire, and I was about to quote the man from Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And I was thinking, maybe I won't go uh, to the protest. I have so much work to do. And um, Paulo Freire spoke to me from the words on his page and urged me and said, nothing is more important in this moment and time. And so I, uh, I left the house and I went down to the art museum to the protest that began at, at two o'clock. And um, I, uh, I'm so glad that uh, those words um, encouraged me to be the conscience in the moment to do what I, I know I needed to do. Um, and, uh, it was beautiful. Um, it was lots of people, all different kinds of people coming together, um, with, uh, a good intention. Um, when the protests began to move back to city hall, I, I began to sense, um, uh, a different level of energy, um, that, um, uh, I, I knew for me it was, it was time, um, um, I believe in nonviolence. Um, and so uh, I, I headed home, um, but I was, um, man, I did a lot of listening um, more so than anything else. Cheryl, you or Jason participate? Um, I, I did not go, um, you know, I, I had to, peel myself off the wall because as I said earlier, my son went in New York and um, had multiple arguments with my 16 year old because he wanted to go. And I wasn't gonna let him go. Um, I, 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 I respect any and everyone who goes. I also have to constantly remind myself that there are many ways to protest violence and hatred, and, and that is not one that I choose because I am not going to risk another life lost. And for me, when I see what they dissolve into, and not because of the people who are there for the right reasons, but for the people who come there deliberately um, to disrupt and to change the message and to, and to wreak havoc um, and incite violence, um, I feel like I'm falling right into their trap by going and risking my life or by letting my child go and risk his life. And I refuse to give them that satisfaction. And so I find other ways to protest and other ways to take a stand. Um, and so that is, that is my choice in this. Thank you. Um, Jason? Yeah, I, I, I did not go as well for for many of the same reasons that that Cheryl just uh, just outlined um so you know I just want to echo echo those sentiments but at the same time you know I I do support the protesters and I and I understand right I even even um you know I know that there's and maybe the next question is sort of heading in this direction but there's been a lot of criticism about how people protest um, and I think a lot of that conversation becomes counterproductive because it starts to remove the emphasis on why people are protesting. Right? It's very easy to criticize people's methods and lose their message in that. Um, you know, Colin Kaepernick, everyone knows him. You know, he organized and completed a peaceful, nonviolent, quiet quiet in a physical sense, protest of this very same issue. And people called him crazy. People said he was unpatriotic. People said he's disrespecting the country and the flag and his entire message got lost. And here we are now, three or four years later, thousands of bodies later, and the same issue is up again. And people want to criticize now the, the the elevated or the the escalated version of protest that's happening. So, you know, I think it's it's easy to lose the message and the method, um, but but the message is strong and it, and it hasn't changed. 
Thank you, Jason. You actually did go right into the next question, so that's fine. Um, I'll add here that um, Cara actually did call me on Saturday. I was out doing a five-mile walk, and she invited me to attend the, the protest with her. Um, and I told her, let me see how I, I do being in the sun already for two hours. Um, and unfortunately, I, I didn't go. Sun sickness is real for me. And I, I could not take being out in the sun um, any longer for the day. Uh, but I live in King of Prussia. And King of Prussia um, has now protested four days straight. Uh, the very first day was Friday. It was a group of college and high school students that organized. They literally started with only 12 people, four people on each corner of the inter uh, three people on each corner of the intersection. Um, that Saturday, um, and I drove through that Friday, honked my horn, gave them the power fist. Um, that Saturday, I went to get something to eat, and their uh, group had grown to about 50. Um, and I went through the intersection and um, rolled down my window and told them I was proud of them, and you know, honked my horn and gave them the power fist and came back home and said, I'm going to, and well, actually when I went to come home, they had shut down the intersection. The young people had gone into the intersection. And I will say this, you know, with a, a lot of the conversation being um, somewhat against law enforcement and the police, I was never prouder than the Upper Marion, Count, uh, Upper Marion Township Police Department. Um, they were there to support the protesters. Um, they did not harass or badger them. Uh, in fact, when they saw the young people going to the street, they used their cars um, and vehicles to immediately block off the intersection um, and give the young people the time and space um, to do what they needed to do. And um, I went home and I walked back down. By that point, they had left. Um, but on Sunday, uh, someone put on social media, they were coming back to King of Prussia again. And um, I made it my point to be there. And I did, I got there. And by that point, the, the crowd had grown to about 130. And I stayed with them for an hour and um, we held signs and some of the parents were there. A couple other folks from the community stopped and, and lent their support. And um, it was amazing um, to be in a space with people of various ages um, and races um, and saying that this is not okay. Uh, for the people who drove by, who, you know, gave a honk, perhaps in support, um, even for the people who drove by and, and voiced their disdain that we were there, that's okay. Because I appreciate living in a place where people can feel how they want to feel and voice those feelings. Um, and um, by the time I left, which was maybe about 6.30, um, after that, the media did show up. The crowd had grown to over 200. Um, they blocked off the intersection again. Um, when I came home yesterday evening, it was my intention to join them again at five o'clock, but I didn't leave work until 7.30, trying to prepare for you all today. And, um, and when I got ready to go home, they had not only blocked the intersection, now they had moved it back to a street so that people could actually turn off. And the officer is flagging me, go, go, go. And I'm like, I live here. And finally he tells me to stop and he let some other people pass and he motions for me to come forward. And he said, ma'am, I can't hear you. What are you trying to tell me? I said, sir, I live here. I live in this community. And he said, oh, I'm sorry. He said, you can go ahead and go. He said, part of the reason I'm out here today is to keep people from coming into the neighborhoods and also to divert traffic that you all don't have to deal with as residents. And I said, I thank you for your service. Um, so, you know, that's kind of my personal reaction and, and having the opportunity to participate. Um, I'm looking at the time here. While we did have some other questions, I want to make sure that we give time to participants um, who might want to ask a question. Um, you should have like a raise your hand feature. Um, and then I can call your name for you to unmute. Um, and if you don't see it, if you're on camera, if you want to raise your hand, I'll just acknowledge you. <laughs> Either way, I'm literally scrolling through pages. I don't see. Oh, all right. Here we go, Morgan. Hi, how are you? 
I just want to say thank you um, to everybody that that shared today. It was very emotional, but but necessary. Um, I'm not sure what it, the careers of everybody in this group is, but um, I guess one of the questions that came to mind for me is just wondering how it feels and and how to be a kind of successful helper in a helper role um, in a time that feels really helpless. Any of our panelists want to start before I jump in? Cheryl. So I feel obliged. This is one of my wonderful doctoral students. Hi, Morgan. <laughs> um, I think I think that's a really great question because I think that we are a profession of hope and healing. And I think that um, many of us are hard pressed to find hope and, and, and to heal right now. And um, what I would say is, is never underestimate the power of, of, of sharing witness and bearing witness. When I sit with my clients now who are um, mostly, but not all African-American women, uh, I sit in solidarity with them. Um, I offer an invitation for them to share um, their experiences. And even though we may share the same ethnic group, we still have a variety of experiences and responses um, to what's going on. And so I make space for them to share that. Um, and, and I offer um, validation and empathy. And then before we wrap up, I talk with them about how to take care of themselves in this um, and how to be here um, to continue to press on, how to be here to continue to fight. I think I sent an email and I said, I'm gonna call my sons, I'm gonna tell them I love them um, and then I'm gonna go to bed because tomorrow is another day and I don't know what's coming. And that's what I tell you know my clients to do. We don't know what's coming, but we, we want to take care of ourselves so that we can be prepared for it. And I know that when you're working across culture, the fear is that you'll say the wrong thing or the fear is that you uh, will be perceived as not being able to understand, which is true because there are elements of this that you cannot understand. Um, but I think that, that when you tap into another person's humanity and say, what I can understand is that we are both humans and that I respect your humanity and that that is enough for me to sit here uh, and, and sit in solidarity with you and, and bear witness to what is going on for you, um, that that is very, very powerful. And sometimes that's all we can do, um, but it is very, very powerful. Never underestimate the power of that simple act of, of love and, and giving voice to people who are oppressed. I think I saw Teresa wave her hand. Teresa, if you want to ask your question, it might be about a book title or if you want to add something else to say. Where are we at? Teresa? I'm going to... All right, there we go, Teresa. I'm sorry. It, it, was, uh, it was answered. I think someone answered it as far as in regards to the book. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? If not, I will go back to our scheduled questions, but I wanted to make sure that we are giving participants the opportunity to speak. I'm scrolling again. I don't see hands um okay oh wait a minute karen wendling you have the floor uh, yes i just had a question um i've noticed a lot of i guess what i would call subtle racism in the last few weeks um specifically around covid um like i have you know i have friends that are perfectly fine going to a doctor in Chestnut Hill or Flower Town, but they don't want to go to Temple in West Philly. And it's this, you know, well, there's more people there. There's more COVID there. And 
I really think it's racist, but I don't even know how to start that conversation. Um, you know, because there's naturally a higher density of people there. Um, and so this is something that we, you, you don't even have to answer now, but it's something I've been personally really struggling with. Um, you know, how, how, do I, how do I even approach that with my friends? Um, I, I, I'll jump in here if I can, Karen. Um, I, I would say that you started to engage and maybe you backed off is what it sounds like. So you said, why? And they said, oh, well, there's more people. And so it sounds like you had another question and you didn't go further. And you should say, well, what do you mean more people? Let's, what, I'm trying to understand, what are you talking about? And actually almost challenge them. Um, if they're your friends, I would think then that you can have sometimes challenging conversations um, and to see if they're going to open up to really what that means. Perhaps if they know that you are, um, you know, someone who is definitely about diversity and inclusion and this is what you practice every day, then they might feel uncomfortable, um, you know, really saying something to you because then they'll know, oh, wait a minute, can I, can't say that to Karen. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and you'll know, right, because they'll back down immediately. But I would, I would urge you to push, you know, push a little, push a little um, to see what comes up because I think you are in a place, given where you work, what you do, and just who you are personally, who I've grown to know you to be, um, that would say, you know, if somebody said, well, you know, it's, it, you know, it's, it's just, it's a lot of people like, well, I mean, it's a lot of people of color and maybe I'm not comfortable. That if somebody actually said that, I would look for the Karen I know to say, and what does that have to do with you trying to go to a hospital and get treatment? Why is that a concern? Why are you having some trepidation or fear or uncomfortableness around that? Let's explore that. That's the Karen I know. Yeah, and I, I think the answer, the answer would have been, you know, I think there's a, a misunderstanding about COVID and the black community that because there are underlying conditions that often make the results worse for that group, it doesn't mean you're more likely to have it if you're black. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. If, if I may, I, Karen, you're asking a great question because it's hard sometimes to, um, right, like we talk about assumptions and there's some level of perception assumption in and of the, the comment itself. Um, but I, I think as um, a white person, what you lead with is so important. And, lead, and, and I have so much subject within myself to draw from that if I lead with my own, um, you know, this conversation is in no way to suggest that even though I feel like I'm engaged in the unraveling and the revealing of my own journey in, in all of this, um, I still hold on to, I still have bias, et cetera. And so to lead with my own honesty and to be um, vulnerable and, um, and truthful with others around me can be disarming enough that I am a person who can give permission to other people to be at the very least begin the journey um, and, and, and start with where they're at. And so sometimes I, I agree with Juliana about, about the pushing and the challenging, but if I myself have enough subject matter of which we all do um, to lead with, I think it can be um, more disarming to invite people into the dialogue, particularly among, um, as a white person, in conversation with other people who are white. Juliana? Yes, yes, this is Lakshmi. Lakshmi, yeah. how, how are you doing? Good. I, I want to first thank you and Jason and uh, uh, Cheryl and Kara for uh, doing this. This has been a very emotional time for every one of us and I cannot even say it I come from a country India with all kinds of colors people come in all different colors shapes and looks 
everyone loved each other. I, that's how I was brought to love each other. I never felt discrimination at all. One thing that comes to us, we were taught that beauty and looks are skin deep. If you peel everybody, everyone is red. We all have the same color inside. Why this discrimination? It's all God made. What we have given is what God has given. It's a beauty for every one of us. Never taught this hatred or always to, taught to love each other, love one another and be happy. That's how I feel. The past few days have become so heavy heart, restlessness, unsettling, sad, not knowing what the future is going to be. It's very, very sad. But you have opened the eyes for everybody. Cheryl, thank you for your emotional story. Jason, we are all in this together. Beauty and skin is only skin deep. We are all red inside. Our heart is what counts, not what the looks. Shameful are those people who have done this to, to all the people killing them. You cannot give a life to one person. You cannot give a life to even a fly or a, if you crush an ant, I will say, I can't give the life, so I won't take that life. Who are we to do that and judge other people? Just wanted to see that. It's a heavy heart I live with this. But thank you for recording this. Everyone should see this and open it. Beauty and skin are only skin deep. We are all red inside. Love one another. Heart is good. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Lachman. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I was looking for more hands. If there are like the hand, the raise hand feature, or if you just wave at me. All right, I see you. I'm going to unmute you. I can see your name. Go That's, ahead. It's Barbara Landis. All right, Barbara, go ahead. Um, as I look across the board of the people that are here, we're all of a certain age. No offense. But on Sunday, I got a FaceTime call from my granddaughters who are 12 and 15. And they needed to talk to Nana about what's going on in the world. And I said to them, Nat, did you talk to mommy and daddy? And they said, oh, yes, we did. But Nana, you're closer to Martin Luther King's age. And we wanted to know what things were like then. And I said, what's going on? Now, the older one, who's 15, when she was 12, insisted at L.A. that she went to the Women's March because her Nana went to Washington to the Women's March. But her concern is that she says, Nana, when we go back to school, my friends are black, they're Asian, they're Mexican, they're Jewish. Some of them are LGBT. And she says, I feel like the people at the top are telling us that we need to be divided. Mm -hmm. And that if we're coming to be together, that they're going to send... Um, violence in or guns or whatever in to try to split us up. So my only thought is that as we move ahead and we're all adults here focusing what's on happening with adults, that we also have an appreciation if you're around any younger people that you have time to sit down and have a talk with them because they're going to, we're not really, I'm not sure always addressing them so if you're with any, you know, anyone younger than like in the younger teenagers or whatever else, that they have an opportunity to share their feelings and their fears. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. And since you talked about the young people, I am aware that the president and vice president of our Black Student Union are in the space. And so I told them to be prepared. So be ever so ready. Um, Deja, would you like to have an opportunity to speak? Um, I know that you all are working on a letter um, that you want to share with the college community, but the floor is yours for now. Hi, can you, everyone hear me? Yes, <laughs> we can see you too. Um, I just want to thank everyone for being here and I want to thank you Dr. J for having this meeting. Um, with just living in Philadelphia and seeing everything happen like before my eyes and just talking to my friends and just being like, we never thought that we would live through these days. 
Um, like we never knew that this would come and we would see this and be just living in this moment. Um, it's really sad. It's really scary. Um, the BSU is preparing to, you know, just write a letter to the school community to show that um, we're here, uh, we get it, and we're all trying to fight and, you know, just see better days to come. Thank you, Deja. Diamond, you are the vice president. Do you want to have a, a opportunity to say a few words? Um, yes, I would also like to express the same sentiments. Um, just in gratitude of having this event done. Um, I want to thank uh, Professor Jason Freeman, Ms. Cheryl, and Kara um, just for speaking today and, um, you know, giving a different perspective, not only from an African-American, but from also from a Caucasian. Um, just listening to this is, is helping my heart. I've been very disheartened lately, seeing what's on the news and seeing everything that's going on and having some friends being able to protest and Unfortunately, I'm unable to protest because of, you know, Corona still being a thing and, you know, still being out there spreading. So it's, it's kind of difficult um, to be in a space where you want to help your people, but you're not necessarily capable of doing that. So um, I appreciate the dialogue and everything that's coming forth, as well as the letter that we we're sending out for the BSU. So I just want to thank you. Thank you, ladies. I appreciate you and for the work that you're doing for the students, not just for students in BSU, but for um, all of our, our CHC students, you do have a voice. Um, I wanna make sure that we can get to one last thing as we're wrapping up. Um, there's been so much uh, heartfelt um, personal experiences and stories. I'm so grateful for the three panelists for being vulnerable in this space. I know how hard it is to do, um, but I wanna make sure that we leave um, talking about hope. And so with so much despair, do you still have hope? And if so, what does that look like for you? Um, and if not, why? And how do you think that you, we can all return to some level of hopelessness? What do we do to get there? So it was kind of loaded, but you all had the questions in advance. Um, so if we can talk about where we are with hope. Jason, if you'll start. Sure. Um, for me, in, in this situation, what I, what I sort of see as hope is, in some ways, this feels a little different. Um, so, you know, I guess sort of being aware and, and thinking about sort of what Cara, Cara you mentioned, Cara, sorry, you mentioned earlier, um, that you're worried that the momentum will sort of die down, um, you know, as it becomes less popular or, or, or you know, um, or people lose interest, but I'm hoping that that is not the case. And somehow this particular um, situation feels a little different. It feels like there's more momentum. It feels like there are more people involved. It feels like there are more non-Black people involved in, um, in the protest and the education and the conversation around it. Um, so for me, that gives me a little bit of hope that maybe we'll be able to get something done maybe we'll be able to, to actually affect some real change in, in this area. Um, but, you know, a lot, of, a lot of work ahead, and I'm not holding my breath, but there is hope in that. Thank you. Cheryl? Um, I feel like overall I have to have hope because of my sons. Um, I have to have hope that they um, will live and also that the world will be worth living in, if you will. Um, my, I guess my challenge is what I have hope for. Um, I think that the, um, the systemic oppression or the system, um, a, a colleague of mine, um, um, Jay, Dr. Logan, uh, gave this beautiful analogy of thinking about what's going on as if you think about a tree, uh, we're pecking at the leaves, but the, the problems are at the roots. And if you think about how long it takes trees to grow and be what they are, um, it, 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 this is generations and generations in the making. And so do I have hope that we're going to overturn uh, institutional racism and discrimination and, and the foundation upon which this country was built? Absolutely not. 
I don't have hope for that. Um, but do I have hope that positive change can come out of this horror? Yes. Um, do I have hope that people have been enlightened and their hearts have been changed? Finally, finally, from what happened? I do, yes. Um, I also am so grateful to be where I am because where I am is a privilege. Um, I, I live in a community where I can go out and not be afraid when I'm in my community. And I know that many people can't say that. Um, I work at a place where I can go into Chestnut Hill College and feel welcome and valued and wanted with wonderful colleagues and friends of every race. Um, and I am so grateful. And I know that that is a privilege and that is not everyone's experience. Um, I know that I am part of a group that's training the next generation of psychologists to, to have cultural humility and to value all life um, and to understand people at their roots and at their core um, so that they can understand their pain um, as opposed to judge them. And, and so I have hope about the bubble that I'm in with full acknowledgement that my bubble is unique. Um, and I hope that other people can find bubbles to be in that are safe and affirming and positive um, for them. Uh, we have to create bubbles and villages um, because I don't think we can undo the system, at least not in my lifetime. Thank you, Cheryl. Kara? Yeah, I, I hold hope high. Um, this morning I went to vote and I live in the city. Um, and uh, there were a lot of um, folks out ready to also um, cast their ballot. And I hope that everyone will. Um, so um, I, I hold on to hope. I think I share Cheryl's um, question of uh, possibility and, and probability. Um, in terms of um, systemic change, um, but I uh, I wouldn't be in the work of uh, of mission and um, if I didn't really wholeheartedly, especially being um, a part of a mission that all may be one, um, I wouldn't be in this work if I didn't believe in in the movement um, of spirit. So yes, I very much. Um, hold on to hope. I don't know what that means, but I do know that it continues to propel me forward. Thank you so much. For a closing comment or final word, as I'm kind of known to have, um, I started with President Barack Obama. I want to end with him. So um, one of the, one of his uh, latter paragraphs in the article I was telling you about he says this, so the bottom line is this, if we want to bring about real change, then the choice is in between protest and politics. We have to do both. We have to mobilize to raise awareness and we have to organize and cast our ballots to make sure that we elect candidates who will act on reform. So let's get busy. Um, again, I wanna thank all of our panelists, Jason, Cheryl, and Cara, my dear colleagues, but more importantly, you have become my friends. Um, I am grateful for you sharing of your personal voice. I know this is not always easy to do, um, especially in the workplace and work environment um, to allow people to see our most vulnerable selves. Um, but I'm glad that you joined me in this. I thank you to all of our participants who got in. Um, I'm, again, so sorry that uh, we, we had this uh, capacity to deal with, um, but I thank you um, for coming in. Some of you, af after people had to leave because they had another meeting, I was still allowing people to come in. Um, so even if you just saw the end of it, um, I'm grateful for you being here. Thank you for those who had questions or comments. Thank you for the chat room um, and where people were also uh, leaving some words. 
Um, this video will be posted by our AV department. They are going to post on our YouTube channel um, by tomorrow, so you will be able to see it. Um, and then, oh, I also wanted to say, I believe she is still in the building, um, our wonderful energetic librarian known as Kelly Liberona uh, contacted <laughs> me and said that um, she was very much interested in working with me for a resource list. Um, many of you have been emailing me for the last couple of days. Um, and so Kelly and I had a quick off the cuff conversation. I was throwing out some names. I think I've asked Cara to send her some names uh, as well. Um, and then I wanna thank uh, Dr. Jeffrey Carroll. I believe he is in the building still. And he uh, put together a resource list uh, that talks about or speaks to politics and protesting and riots and kind of the history of those things. So we hope to compile all of this. Well, not all, but you know what we can workably put together because we know that there will be resources beyond what we will find and have time for. But we hope to put together a resource list that I believe Kelly is going to make available on the library's webpage. Um, I believe that is her intention. So there will probably be an email from me um, with her as my co-signer, inviting everyone to visit said page um, at their leisure. Um, it will be a compilation of books, articles, um, some of the video links uh, for what I, I've shared. I'll put those out there um, and that way people can go back to it when they have the chance. Finally, I wanna say thank you to our president, Sister Carol Jean Vail, for her leadership. Um, she makes it easy uh, for me to do these programs um, and um, has, has given me the opportunity to not only serve her and the institution, um, but to do so in a way um, that sometimes I think is fitting, even when maybe everybody does not always agree. So I appreciate the, um, the latitude to be able to um, speak before you, with you, um, and to inform um, in the ways that kind of God lays on my heart. So I thank you, um, Sister Carol, for being with us today. She has been with us uh, for this program. Um, and um, I thank everybody. So having said that, we are like five minutes over time. I know folks got other stuff to do. Um, and so have a great afternoon. And just know that while we're still talking about hope, just in case you find yourself in spaces where you're not okay, that's okay too. Thank you so much. Be blessed, be well, be safe.